and welcome to Time to Talk. My name is Aaron Hall from Ottawa Hill School of Business and today my guest is Mr. Paul Baumgartner, Director of Nutrition Services. So welcome. Thank you. I'm a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to talk about school meals and, and the impact that that has on, on our schools. I would like to know more about them too. Sure. Well, we like to think the school meals make a difference. In fact, we believe, about, we believe that passionately. The school meals are building blocks for the brain. Our mission in our department is to provide academic support to the students of, of Grand Rapids Public Schools through the delivery of nutrition services. Right. So the old adage, you know, hungry children can't learn. If, I, if, I, if, I, if my stomach is growling, I can't concentrate on the teacher, right? Right, you want to be able to focus. Right. So, but it's more than just being hungry. It's, it's about having proper nutrition and laying down life skills that are going to um, uh, last a lifetime and make that student successful not only in the school setting but in life beyond. So making healthy intentional choices about the food that we eat and the physical activity that we engage in on a daily basis. Right, because when you have um, the proper nutrition and stuff like that, you have you also have the strength to move around and everything. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, unfortunately, we're bombarded daily with with advertisement and expectations about what a portion size is and how good food tastes and all that. And right. and uh, we like salty, we like sweet, and we like fat. <laughs> okay, it tastes good, right. and that's absolutely right. Every one of us, myself included. But what do we know about salt, fat, okay, and sweet is that unless you're willing to uh, um, expend the energy that you take in through food, right. you're going to have health issues. Right. And like, like in, today, in today's generation, they're, like a teenager would probably take a Snickers over a carrot. Absolutely. It's right. Right, right. And, and back in the day, there wasn't that choice between Snicker and carrots. It was right. carrot, <laughs> right? right? So what we have to do, it's much more difficult now with all the choices that are available to, to, to students today to make that right choice. And so my mission and the mission of all of our employees at the, the Nutrition Center is to, number one, make those choices available on a daily basis. So, for instance, in the junior highs and the high schools, we have those fresh choice bars. And those fresh choice bars are just full of fresh fruits and vegetables. And we encourage students to take as much as they want. And you can take as much of that as you want. And the idea being that that choice and getting acclimated to eat, reaching for the carrot stick versus reaching for the snicker bar is going to not only make you uh, uh, n more nourished during the day and give you that fuel to learn, right. but it's also going to lay that foundation uh, throughout the, a lifetime as a habit. Exactly. Right, because when you talk to, if you, you talk to foreign exchange students or students that are just coming to the United States for the first time in Ottawa or Central, their taste buds are completely different than ours. They are totally different. Absolutely. <laughs> and if you take, if you go visit their home and, and eat a native dish of, of say, uh, uh, even in Mexico, Guatemala, uh, Eastern Europe or, or Sudan, or the Middle East, the salt profile, the sweet profile is way lower than what we're accustomed to. Right. And it's not by design, it's just that's the way it is. But look at the health contrast between Americans versus other folks of the world. Because of that lower salt, because of that lower sugar, and the increased activity level. So it's hard because what do we have? We've got cell phones, we've got PlayStations, right, we've got yeah. transportation, iPods. iPods. <laughs> Stuff like that, man. So when I get home, what am I going to do? Hop on the couch. Right. Right. <laughs> Where back in the day, we were, we were raised that, hey, if it's light out, you're outside. <laughs> because, there, you know, what do we have? Three TV stations to watch and radio. That was it. Right, <laughs> so I'm like. not gonna, what am I going to look at? So... That's why it's so much harder for kids today, and you have to make intentional choices. And our mission, our nutrition mission at Grand Rapids Public Schools is to make those choices readily available right. and provide the support to you uh, through uh, evening events, through after school activities, uh, nutrition education. So I invite anyone out there to check out our website uh, and see all the exciting things that we have to offer, recipe ideas, all those kind of things. And we'd love to have students come out to our nutrition center and tour our facility, 
see all the things that we do in terms of making foods, creating new recipes. Um, we had uh, the sixth grade class from uh, Blanford come out, tour our facility, oh, and yeah. I said, hey, um, what would you like to see in a menu? So we started debating back and forth about my budget constraints, the business of school meals, because school meals is a business. It is. It is, because our funding comes only from the customer. You're the customer. I don't get a set amount of money and said, here you go for the rest of the year. I'm only as good as that last meal that I serve. And just like a restaurant, I have to support my department by the participation of the students coming through and paying that money. Now, they may pay the money through the, the free and reduced meal of the government, or they may pay cash right on the, right on the table. And I have to support my program. So when kids say, well, how come you don't have this or that? Well, I have to have a budget, just like at home. So one of the things that we came up with, they came up with the recipe themselves. Uh, they called it a uh, um, sugar bush salad. <laughs> they wanted something to, 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 uh, to reflect what they do at Blanford. And right now at this time of the year, they're tapping all the trees for maple syrup. And that's a sugar bush. Oh, wow. And so they're boiling down all this sap and making maple syrup from scratch. And so that's something they're proud of. And so the, could, they, could, they, could we come up with a recipe that would reflect sugar bush time? And so we came up with a chicken fajita that is just the same chicken fajita that you guys have normally. We use it for uh, orange glazed chicken or we use it for um, uh, a lemon chicken. So we said, well, can we incorporate maple syrup into this dish? and come up with a recipe that would reflect what's going on at Blanford. And so that'll be featured in March. Okay. So it'll be healthy, it'll, there'll be a recipe that goes along with it, and it's something that reflects the culture of Blanford. And so we're real excited about that. And those are the kind of things that we love to do at the Nutrition Center. That sounds pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and we're always looking for ways to incorporate legumes and beans, why? because it's a high protein, low fat product. And it's like, well, geez, I'm not gonna eat this. How am I gonna do this? So that's why in the elementary buildings, we use the concept of food coaching, okay? And food coaching means I can't just put food on the table, right? <laughs> right. Just like mom, <laughs> what's mom do? Come on, baby, you gotta eat that, right? Right. Well, we gotta do the same thing in school. I can't just give you an algebra book and expect you to open it up and just be enthralled with algebra, <laughs> right? But you know it's important to know algebra, to understand right. the concepts. So we need the same thing with food. So we in the elementary buildings have adults and teachers walking around, talking to the kids. Take a taste. Try this. Try hummus. What's hummus? Try these, these greens. Why am I eating greens? Why am I eating peas? And by engaging students and having adults eat the food too and be just as excited about the food as I am, that's going to make a difference. And so um, we really think it's important that adults model the same behavior that we're preaching, practice what you preach. Right. And students will, will see that the same way they see the importance of, of, of reading that algebra book, of reading history, of, of, of uh, learning about business, because it's something that you're gonna need as an adult. And good health is something you're gonna need as an adult. And good nutrition is part of that. So, um my first question to you is how long have you actually like been in like the cooking mm. district? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the cooking business? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> I've been hilarious. in the cooking business since I was a teenager, 1978. Wow. I was working for Tommy Brands over there on South Division as a busboy. That's how <laughs> I got my first start. And I never looked back. I just love the, the food business. And I worked my way through high school, worked my way through college in the restaurants, and just was observant and started out as a busboy, I want to be a dishwasher. Why? Because I want to be in the kitchen. In the kitchen, you look and see what the cook's doing. How can I learn how to do that? That looks like fun. And then work, just, just by being observant and working your way up and asking just to be involved, be there, be present. And then uh, in college, learned about the school, uh, learned about the food industry, that you can get paid to cook. You can get paid to manage restaurants, manage school districts, uh, food service, uh, college campuses, and then there's a whole other field of food science I didn't even know about. So uh, I just kept on working in the food industry, got my degree, and then once I got out of college, uh, started working at Aquinas College as the assistant food service director. 
And speaking of Aquinas, um, we took a field trip there not too long ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, colleges have food. One of, the, one of the little lessons I learned about making a career choice was I thought, all right, where am I going to have stability? And one thing that I learned in the restaurant business was everybody wakes up hungry. Yes. You feed and feed and feed, and guess what? They'll be there the next day. Mm-hmm. So that's job security. So that was important to me. And so I thought, well, the food business is really cool. And uh, I was in healthcare. I was in uh, working for Steelcase, helping them out with their food because factory workers need food too. And there's cafeterias and factories. And then the opportunity came up to, to come back to Grand Rapids Public Schools. And I went to Grand Rapids Public Schools and it was exciting for me to be able to come back and make a difference right here in my own district and uh, uh, open this commissary 22 years ago is how long it's been since we opened up our first commissary and started scratch cooking. Wow. And we serve about 22,000 meals a day uh, here in Grand Rapids and we provide meal service not only for Grand Rapids Public Schools but for East Grand Rapids. They eat the exact same meals you guys do right here in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids Christian Schools and we have a handful of elementary Catholic schools in the city that use the same menus that we use right here in Grand Rapids. Wow, okay. Yeah, so we're real proud of our programs and, and nutrition, the nutritional needs of a child in East Grand Rapids isn't any more important than the nutritional needs of a child in Grand Rapids. We all need fuel to learn. We all need school meals as that building block uh, to, to better brains. So it doesn't matter where you are, you need good nutrition and that's our mission. So if I may ask, what would you say would be your fondest memory? My fondest memory. Every day is a fond memory in <laughs> Grand Rapids Public Schools. But I, I'd say my fondest memory um, was uh, my first year working in school meals here in Grand Rapids and running into an old principal oh, when wow. I was a kid, right? Right. Sixth grade. And saying it was, his name was uh, Mr. Stiles. And coming up to him in a meeting and saying, and I'm, you know, I'm an employee now. And there's, there's my old principal. I say, hey, Mr. Stiles, you remember me? Yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> I work with you now. That was really um, a magic moment for me. And uh, uh, keeps me motivated because I know that the work that I do here in Grand Rapids is making a difference in the lives of the students um, every single day and in our community and it's neat to be able to uh, work in a community where I not only grew up but also with people that grew up with me right. you know uh, there's a there's a principal uh, here in town uh, over at Southwest Community Campus uh, Mrs. Fernandez she and I were in the same neighborhood as kids and so she's a principal and I'm the food service director how cool is that that sounds really cool yeah so those are, those are really fond memories for me, and that keeps me motivated to keep coming to work every day. Out of all the foods you have tried in your life, <laughs> what would you say would be your favorite food? Oh, boy, that's a hard question. <laughs> what is my favorite food? I don't know, because I've tried an awful lot of different foods, and, um, you know, believe it or not, it all comes down to one thing, and that's pizza. I love pizza. I would have to say my favorite would probably have to be my mom's, um, oh, what is it called? <laughs> it's, it's my favorite food by her, and I can't remember it right What is now. it, meat or? No, 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 no. Oh, it's my mom's um, coleslaw. Coleslaw. Yes, yeah. I love when she does it. Oh, my God. That's awesome. You know, we're working on, a, on one of our coleslaw recipes. We call it the purple power salad. The purple power. Purple power salad wow. so you know uh, um, the more colorful the foods that you eat the more vitamins are in them so you know they say eat your rainbow so what we're using is is a red cabbage instead of using white cabbage because there's more nutrients in the red cabbage and then um, and then mixing in uh, pineapple chunks to kind of give it a sweet sweetness to it and uh, um, um, one of my teachers had told me that yesterday because we were talking about this. He said, he said, the more colors that you have on your plate, the more healthier it is. That's for you. right. Eat your rainbow. Eat your rainbow. So black eyed peas, dark leafy greens. That's why on those fresh choice bars, we're back in the day, all we used to use was iceberg lettuce, you know, the head lettuce. Mm. Now we try to incorporate uh, uh, spinach and kale and, and escarole. The darker leafy greens 
to blend in with that iceberg lettuce to get those dark vegetables. Green beans, so you see green beans on the menu. Uh, when asparagus is in the season, we'll right. have fresh asparagus. It's a deep green vegetable. So notice we're talking a lot about fruits and vegetables. We're not talking about so much about meat. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> well, like before we get in like to the meat subject, really, how do you think the lunch menu for GRPS students has evolved? Oh, oh that's a really great question. Number one, uh, when it start, when I started, well, when I was a kid at East, in Grand Rapids over uh, Hall School, which was is now Chavez, uh -oh. um, I was actually part of that group of kids that was first getting the school meal program uh, for elementary age. Back in the day, the only time you had hot lunch was when you got to junior high or high school. Wow. And the reason for that was, was because back in the day when you were a kid in the elementary buildings, you went home for lunch. You walked home every day. Wow. And in the junior highs and high schools, you, you, the, the high schools and junior highs were centralized, so you didn't have an opportunity to walk home, okay? So if you're coming from uh, Burton Heights, you're going over to Iroquois, right? You can't walk home from Burton Heights to Iroquois, so you'd stay there. Well, uh, back in probably 1970, 1968, uh, they decided that school meals should be in all public schools. And back then, the school, remember these school buildings were built without kitchens. So we started out with TV dinners. Literally, TV dinners. Wow. And it wasn't very nutritious. <laughs> and it wasn't very palatable. And what happened over the years was gradually we got away from TV dinners to how can we cook food, uh, we cook food in the kitchen, then send it over to the schools hot. But then by the time I got to the school, you know, you don't eat till 11 o'clock, and it took me an hour and a half to get the food there. The food was cold by the time you got it. So then we went to, how can we make the food right there on site and reheat the food, cook the food right before meal service? And so that's, that's what we started doing about 22 years ago, was bringing the food cold to the building site, heating it up just prior to meal service so it could be as hot and fresh as possible, and then start changing that menu around and have control over the ingredients we're putting into it, introducing, instead of just getting canned fruit, have fresh fruit. Instead of canned vegetables, have fresh vegetables. Right. And try to get that blend in there. And that's probably been the biggest change, is, is incorporating more fresh and uh, what we call clean label products. The other thing was when we started, it was just lunch. Now we do school breakfast, we do school lunch, and we do after school snack programming. So there's three opportunities during the school day that we have the opportunity to put nutritious product in front of the students. So now the challenge is, okay, we're doing this. We're putting nutritious food out in front of the children. How can we get the food into their stomachs instead of the trash can? Right. That's the challenge. And so um, it's been exciting to see that evolution from back in the day of just having a TV dinner and just going right in the trash to fresher foods, uh, um, more fruits and vegetables, and starting to interact with students and having opportunities like this to talk about our meal program. Because uh, I think a lot of folks just think a school lunch is nasty. And it's just, you know, not really part of my life. And it's so much more than that. But you got to be able to, you know, engage in it. Right. Yeah. So, okay, so now we're going back into the meat subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, when you guys, like, do the meat and stuff, do you take all the necessary precautions with the meat? Oh, absolutely. Food, one of the things being in the food business is you got to be concerned about safety and sanitation. So all of our cooks have to be certified and all of them have to take a safety and sanitation class to make sure they understand uh, the, 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 the hazards of foodborne illness and what the proper cooking temperatures are and all those kind of things. So f f that's why you see ladies wearing hair nets. Why, that's why you see them wearing gloves. That's why uh, we limit access to the kitchen so that we can control the sanitation in the kitchens. Uh, if you come to our central commissary, there's a big yellow stripe all around certain areas where only authorized people are to be there so that we can ensure the integrity and wholesomeness of the product. And so um, we document when we cook from scratch, um, that's one of the reasons why we don't cook from scratch in all of the buildings, is because we want to be able to control raw ingredients and make sure that it's being prepared properly and documented. And so we bring in raw ground beef, for example, and when we make taco meat, 
but it, we're, we're taking a, a one, one batch of taco meat requires 550 pounds of raw beef. Wow. And how are we going to cook that and bring it up to the proper temperature and then chill it properly so that we're, we're maintaining uh, a minimum of foodborne pathogens? And we actually take that product, samples of it, and we'll take it to a laboratory and test it to make sure that it, we're staying within the requirements to make sure that it's a clean product. And then we okay. also have monthly in-services for our employees to remind them about the need of safety and sanitation. So it's an ongoing challenge, just like it is to make sure you're making intentional choices about food and exercise, you have to be intentional about safety and sanitation. Am I washing my hands all the time? Right. Am I using a hairnet? Am I taking that temperature? Those kind of things. So just um, for fun, have you ever like just come up with your own recipe at like like out of boredom? Oh yeah, not 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 so much out of boredom. What I like to say is uh, prepare to repair. Some of the best recipes were made because you made a mistake. Oh. Prepare to repair. So oops, I overdid it. So then I'm going to back it off and and fix something. Um, or I'm at home. This is what I like to do at home the most: is open up the cupboard, open up the fridge, see what I got, and just start making mixing up leftovers and mixing up different ingredients and seeing how it tastes. And you'd be surprised at some of the things you come up with. <laughs> um, so are you like happy with this, um, this career right now? Or? Oh, absolutely. It's, I, I said I've been, been here in Grand Rapids for 22 years and I've been doing food. I've been the food dude since 1978. So <laughs> I don't remember how long that is, but it's a long time. Now, this is a question that that, um, that I think is like, to me, to me that I think is really good. Do you make your food more creatively than other chefs or like other people? I think so. Um, we really make a conscious effort of trying to engage the students and, and make things um, exciting. And so that's, you know, it's talking about the purple power salad. Well, it's coleslaw, right? <laughs> right. Okay, it's red cabbage, but we call it purple power salad. We mix pineapple chunks in with, the, with, with it uh, to try to get it sweet and, and exciting looking and, 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 and have good eye appeal. Um, we, we make a, a orange glazed chicken, um, and it's kind of an Asian blend. And um, why? Because we know students like that, that, that little bit of heat and that tang. And so how am I going to come up with that? Like, but that's some of the students out there. I don't really like hot stuff. Uh huh. <laughs> so, in in that case, so we say, all right, and we get that feedback from the kids. And you know, the best feedback is, believe it or not, isn't generally what the kids say. It's what the kids do. And what do they do? Are they gonna? They can tell me they like the food, but then I see them turn around and throw it out. Oh. So what does that tell me? That tells you that. They really, they didn't. really didn't like it. So I always want to look at the trash cans. How heavy was the trash bag today? That'll tell me. Talk to the custodians. Talk to the folks that have to haul the trash out. If it's a light trash day, man, I hit a home run. People all ate my food. It was in their stomach and not, not in their belly. So we get that feedback. And there's also online surveys, and we send people out and talk to kids too. But uh, again, just like any adult or any child, it's the actions that count, not the words. Okay, this question right here may seem a little strange, but but like I've always wondered, and 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 like another friend of mine has too. But but like, what is like, like what's the thing with food coloring? Like, can you like food coloring? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, food coloring is is a way to enhance uh, the appearance of food. Number one. Now you can do it in a variety of ways. So it could be as simple as taking chopped parsley and just sprinkling it on top of, of uh, a dish, right? right? Why'd you do that? Parsley isn't gonna add much to it, but it makes the eye pop, right? It makes the right. food pop. So um, people use all sorts of chemical, you can use chemical food colorings, okay? Like we think of those red dyes and yellow dyes and all that kind of thing. Or you can use uh, a more uh, physical properties like a parsley, something like that, or orange twist. And um, when I, I don't know if you remember uh, turkey gravy. Remember, did you ever have turkey gravy when you were in elementary school? 
I would th- serve it over a biscuit or serve it over mashed potatoes. Oh, yeah, not over. Yeah, or macaroni and cheese. When I first developed those recipes a long time ago, to make the color appear better, I used what was called egg shade. Egg shade is a food coloring. It makes it brighter yellow, okay, right. rather than a gray color. Okay, the natural colors sometimes are a little, little less vibrant. So by adding egg shade, it made that color pop, okay? But one of the trade-offs in that, in that uh, uh, food coloring is you have to be concerned now about the allergen effect. Is this gonna, is this gonna compound in a pre-existing condition with allergies? Does it add salt unnecessarily to the recipe? Those kind of things. So uh, we reevaluate that and we don't use egg shade anymore. But does that mean that all food colorings are bad? No. It just means that you have to be aware of anything that you're putting into a product. There has to be a good reason for it, and the trade-offs have to make sense. So in this particular uh, example, that egg shade, the trade-off of making that color pop, wasn't nearly as important as the allergen effect that that would create with the children. So we took that out. So... So in relevation to this subject, can there be such a thing as blue macaroni? You can make colors anything you want. (laughs) You know, green eggs and ham. Remember Dr. Seuss, the storybook green eggs and ham? Uh So you take eggs that are uh, between the white and yellow color and make them green. Make the ham this pink green. How do you do that? You just add green food coloring to it. So yeah, that's what's fun about food is you can be as creative and crazy as you want. Because, because, like, I've thought about doing that a couple of times, like, just, like, just kind of, like, putting food coloring in, like, macaroni or something. Mm-hmm. And, see and it, just see what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the fun of it, is prepare to repair, prepare to amaze, and add in a little bit. And one thing I just want to caution you, as you're cooking, as you're playing with that stuff, is always start out with a little bit. You can always add, but you can never take away. Right. So you just, just start off small and then see what it looks like. So... If you're playing around with that example, I'd make a pot of macaroni and cheese for the family, right? Mm. Then I'd take a little side of it, and then I'd take the food coloring and just color just a side of it, and then look at that color and see if that was something that I liked. And if I'm like, hey, take a sample. You guys like this? Do you think this is, hey, I got a good reaction? Okay, now I'll put it in the full batch and mix it up, and now you got a new creation. Right. And <laughs> you can put your name to it, too. That's what's fun. It's your creation, just like writing something. So, um, have you ever, like, cooked for, like, a prisoner, or, 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 like, what's the most famous person that you have cooked for? The most famous person uh, I cooked for was uh, Vice President Biden. Are you serious? Yeah, Vice President Biden, when he was here at Central High School. I did not know that. Yeah, he had to eat. He was hungry. Wow. And you know what he likes? He likes Coca-Cola. He likes uh, um, that zero, zero Coke. He had to have zero Coke, and he had to have peanuts. Well, <laughs> I'm a nutrition guy. He needs, our vice president needs more than Coca-Cola and peanuts. So, yeah, I, have, I put it on there. But we also made some fresh hummus and a vegetable tray, some fruits, so that he could have something else besides just a handful of peanuts and a Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, yeah, he was the most famous, I suppose. But uh, when uh, I was in college and working in a restaurant in East Lansing, the governor at the time, um, Governor Blanchard, would come to our restaurant. I used to make a meal for Governor Blanchard all the time. It would be pretty amazing if you like would be, be able to make a dish for Obama. Oh yeah, that would it be sure pretty would. amazing. I wrote a letter to, to Mrs. Obama and asked her to come to one of our park parties this summer. Wow, I hope she responds. I hope she does too, because <laughs> I think she'd love it here. So, so this is like the end right now? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, but that's like all the time we have for today. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I really enjoyed the time here with you and, and talking about food and school meals. I and did too. Yeah, it's fun. And, and it's something that anybody can do at home. And um, anybody can get in line at school and try breakfast, try lunch. Don't skip it. Right. That, that's something that I got to start doing, too. Yep. <laughs> I got to start eating lunch more. Yeah. Our ladies are waiting for you. Love to have you. Uh, um, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here.